The gut health trend has been on the rise in the recent years and it is definitely here to stay. Around 18% of the global population appear to be experiencing bloating on a weekly basis. This is why a lot of companies, both supplement companies, but right now even food and beverage companies are trying to help you boost your gut health, of course, in exchange for your hard earned money. And it looks like we're actually tired of probiotics, we already know what that is and what that does to our body, so we're moving into a field that the public does not know a lot about, such as prebiotics. This is why today we're covering the market of prebiotics, why everybody is so crazy about them, some prebiotics of the companies and if their drinks are actually worth it, are they better than a regular soda or are they just a scam? And we're also going to talk about the hidden risks behind a high consumption of CMOS and some very large disclaimers that are not being disclosed on the web pages of these CMOS brands. Everything in this video is evidence-based and all of the sources will be linked down in the description below. Enough rambling, let's get right into the video. Before we go into the companies, let's clarify what prebiotics actually are so that you can make informed choices about your health in the future. Prebiotics are a part of the compounds that are included in the entire fiber group. You all know that fiber is very beneficial for your gut health. However, prebiotics are special in the way that they can be fermented by the bacteria in your guts and therefore they boost the growth of specific bacteria that has been proven to have beneficial effects for your health. Prebiotics are contained in a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. Just some of them are onions, garlic, artichoke, bananas, red beets, asparagus, peas, beans, just so many different things. And recently also seaweed. This is why we're covering sea moss as well today. There are a lot of different compounds that fall into the group of prebiotics that you might see on the label of prebiotic products. Some of those are fructans, with the most popular one being inulin, which is included a lot in prebiotic sodas. It is also one of the most well-researched ones and has been found to have a lot of beneficial effects for our health. But other prebiotics include galacto-oligosaccharides, xili-oligosaccharides and other compounds with very long and complicated names that are hard to pronounce. When prebiotics are fermented by our gut bacteria, the so-called short-chain fatty acids are also produced, I've talked about them before on this channel, short chain fatty acids together with a balanced gut microbiome have wonderful effects on our overall health. They support not only our intestinal function but also our cognitive function because of the gut brain axis connection. They also help lower our inflammation and help regulate our lipid metabolism, so the fat metabolism in our body. They can aid in lowering our cholesterol levels. They are just so many many benefits to having a well-balanced gut microbiome. And recently there has even been more research on the topic of even like reproductive system health and specifically vaginal health and the gut microbiome and the connection between the two. In previous videos that I made there are some studies done between 2000 and 2010 so 20 years ago. Here most of the studies are actually after 2020. There are even some done last year. This means that this is a very rapidly growing field of research and even some of the things I say today might be not true in the next five years. Who knows? Now that you have a good understanding of what prebiotics actually are, we're going to move into the different products on the market, starting off with the very recently launched prebiotic soda by Bloom and this is called Bloom Pop. If you're into supplements, wellness and all of that, I am 100% sure that you have heard of Bloom. Bloom has has been popular because of their green superfood good health powder but this is a topic for another video. Now we're covering their prebiotic soda that came out this month. It is already sold out on their website so we're going to look into that now. First it has 20 calories per can which if you're somebody that watches their caloric intake this is very great because you're not going to offset that by anything. 20 calories is basically nothing. The first thing that makes an impression is that they do not 
not disclose how much fiber is in the drink, which is for me a big no-go if you're marketing it as supporting gut health. Your main thing is that it has prebiotic fiber and you're not saying how much is there in the drink. If you can do simple math, you can calculate it by yourself because there are 5 grams of carbohydrates total and 3 of them are sugar and 5 minus 3 equals 2. So the remaining 2 grams of carbohydrates should be coming from the prebiotic fiber. Two grams of carbohydrates is not a lot. You're getting more from a small apple. Just to market it as good health boosting is already very misleading when you have only two grams of prebiotic fiber. However, we're just going to pass by that for now and come back to that later. Now we're gonna look at the other ingredients that make an impression. And the first one is stevia. All the prebiotic sodas appear to contain stevia leaf extract and that is because stevia does not have the bad rep of artificial sweeteners. Artificial sweeteners have been linked to a decline in the balance of the gut microbiome and generally have other negative effects on our intestinal health such as bloating, flatulence, they act as laxatives, all of that. Stevia, on the other hand, does not appear to influence the gut microbiome, at least according to all of the research until now, in a negative way. The debate is actually whether it influences in a good way or in no way at all. However, until now there are mainly animal studies and also in vitro studies done. In vitro means that they were done on cells or like cell lines so no animals were involved. There was only one human trial that I found, it is actually pretty recent, and this trial concluded that there was no beneficial effect on the gut microbiome, so no effect at all. Additionally, I want to mention something about one animal study that I found. It investigated the impact of a high fat diet combined combined with stevia and the high fat diet with normal sugar and the study found that the mice that were fed the high fat stevia diet did not have any better gut microbiome balance compared to the other ones so you should really be ranking your problems and if you're eating a diet that is making your gut microbiome so much worse the stevia is not going to counteract the damage that you're doing moving on to the next ingredient and that is organic cane sugar for those of you who do not know cane sugar is just unrefined sugar because sugar I'm pretty sure you know this comes from a plant but it is so excessively refined and processed that it arrives in the way that you see it in the supermarket and organic cane sugar is just a less refined version of that and it has a good reputation because it still contains some of the antioxidative compounds and the phenolic acids all of these different things that were contained in the original plant and that are linked to lowering inflammation and lowering the oxidative stress in your body. This is why also organic cane sugar gets I don't know a pass here but again it's still sugar it is going to raise your insulin levels it is not something magical that has nothing to do with regular sugar at all does it, is it better than normal sugar yes somewhat i do not want to really cancel that here citric acid is just there for conservation if you're wondering i don't know what they put organic apple cider vinegar what is the reason behind that because apple cider vinegar is being marketed a lot but generally the only effect that it appears to have for sure is lowering the insulin response after a meal if you ingested organic apple cider vinegar prior to the meal and it is hypothesized that this is because of the acidic contents in the apple cider vinegar so you could technically have probably the same effect by lemon juice this is why all of these things are kind of in the wellness space but technically it is not going to have any specific effect on your gut microbiome so I don't know why they put it there probably because it sounds very healthy and wellness-y. Also on the topic of the prebiotic fiber, I forgot to mention, I don't know why she went for xylo-oligosaccharides or the team behind Bloom, whoever designed this, because xylo-oligosaccharides are not that well researched compared to other fibers such as inulin. So this was kind of weird for me when I went to look for xylo-oligosaccharides research. I found basically one randomized controlled trial and also one pilot study, but I didn't find like a systematic review which I was able to find for inulin. Now that we're done with the ingredients lists I went to the Walmart website to look for the price because it was sold out on the Bloom website and it appears to be around $240 per can which isn't too bad. My only problem with this is that it's very misleading as good health supporting when it contains 2 grams of prebiotic fiber 
which is less than 10% of your daily recommended intake. The daily recommended intake is around 30 grams, depending if you're a man or a woman. It is something that you might grab if you do not want to get the regular soda, but by no way is this going to regulate your gut issues. This, this is just a very false claim. And I wonder if they're going also to be sued like the other company that we're discussing today, and that is Poppy. I think this is the original brand that got very popular for the prebiotic sodas. They are very similar in their ingredient list, so I'm thinking that Bloom basically ripped the ingredient list of Poppy because there are some very specific similarities, such as the organic apple cider vinegar. This was very weird to me, like why would you put it in the soda? It's also organic cane sugar is contained stevia, but stevia is contained again in a lot of prebiotic sodas, so maybe that's not really something that they copied. The Poppy prebiotic soda also contains 30 calories, again very negligible, and it contains 3 grams of prebiotic fiber. At least this time it's disclosed. And it's actually written in the ingredient list. 3 grams is better than 2 grams, but it's still not a lot. And this is the main reason why they had to be involved in a 9 million dollar lawsuit. That is because to say that the 3 grams of fiber are going to boost your gut health is just incorrect. It is a claim that supplement brands cannot make, but I'm going to be showing you some other outrageous claims later on in the video. Like they can basically write whatever they want, it doesn't mean that it's true or that it's evidence-based. At least the prebiotic blend here is a bit better in my opinion because it contains a lot of inulin and inulin has some better research compared to the xylo-oligosaccharides when we're talking about prebiotics and gut health. Talking about the lawsuit, now people can technically file for refunds for Poppy, but it's like a few dollars, so I don't think it's really worth the entire hassle of filing for a refund. Poppy was also recently acquired by Pepsi, and this is why also Pepsi is probably coming out with their own prebiotic soda later this year. Their prebiotic soda is said to contain 3 grams of fiber again, which is the same as Poppy's, and again, in my opinion, very negligible. To say that it has any impact on your gut health is just false and misleading for the consumers. It's just a marketing tactic. Olipop is in another brand of prebiotic sodas that has been around for some time now. They actually impressed me a little bit because I expected to see again 2-3 grams of fiber, but when I went to their ingredients list, it actually said 9 grams of fiber, which is almost one third of the recommended daily intake of fiber, and therefore it also has a little bit more calories. It has 45 calories, but again, fiber does have some calories in it, so it's normal that also the calories would go up. There is nothing really problematic about the ingredient list. They have their own blend of prebiotics that they claim to have developed and it contains again a lot of inulin and a lot of prebiotic foods that I already mentioned such as chicory, cassava root, there is also some artichoke, a lot of the things that naturally contain inulin. As a conclusion of everything that I have said about prebiotic sodas, are prebiotic sodas healthier than normal sodas? Yes, because they are not full of sugar. If you want just to grab a healthier option on the go and you're in the supermarket and you have a few options to choose from, then yes, you can go for the prebiotic soda. And if I had all of the three brands lined up in front of me, I would go for Olipop because it has the, a substantial amount of fiber in it compared to the other two. But you cannot rely on this to boost your gut health because this is just false. And by ingesting prebiotic fiber like this, you're robbing yourself of the other beneficial micronutrients that are contained in the original plants that the prebiotic fibers were derived from, such as a lot of vitamins and minerals. So you should really not rely on supplements or on supplemented products like this to help with your gastrointestinal issues, in my opinion. But there are a lot of people that would do anything but have a healthy and balanced diet, and I guess this is why such products were very widely marketed. Moving on to CMOS. CMOS is something that has recently been gaining a lot of popularity because of its very high mineral content. It contains 92 different minerals, which is insane. It already sounds like a superfood. CMOS is something that has been around, of course, for ages, but is not being widely consumed by the population. But it has recently been investigated because of the different compounds that are in it that might be beneficial for us, such as some phenolic compounds, some polyphenols, carotenoids, this is by the way provitamin A that you also can find in carrots and 
papaya and all of the orange fruits and vegetables. Sea moss contains also some phytochemicals that can be metabolized by the gut microbiome. They are different depending on the sea moss variation. There are a lot of different types of algae. There is brown, there is red, there is green and all of them are being right now investigated for the different influences of these compounds on your gut health and also a lot of other things such as type 2 diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease and all of that inflammation as well. And while the research on seaweeds is very promising, again it contains a lot of different vitamins as well, there is a huge disclaimer that is not being said anywhere when you go and look up sea moss brands. I went and looked up two that I found were popular. The first one was the one that is actually in the Bella Hadid video that has been circulating and the second one is another brand that I saw on TikTok. They sell very similar sea moss gels and the sea moss is apparently farmed like in the same region in the Caribbean, this Saint Lucia region. I, I don't know. Just forgive me if I'm being ignorant about something like this. I did not go in depth into the sea moss industry, okay? I was just looking at the nutritional value of it. And these companies, especially the one Sim Sima, not the Bella Hadid one, the other one, make some very big claims uh, just that in my opinion are a bit outrageous. To say that sea moss prevents cancer and fights diabetes is a bit extreme but unless somebody files a lawsuit that is not going to be corrected I suppose. Sea moss because it is very high in minerals is also very high in iodine. Iodine is also something that you find a lot in seafood, generally also fish products. Iodine is very important for regulating your thyroid function so your hormone production but in excess it can cause the same effects on your body as having too little of it so again you have hypothyroidism and a decreased function of your thyroid gland therefore you have a hormonal imbalance and this is not something that you see is talked about at all another thing that accumulates a lot in fish and seafood are heavy metals this is not because of the products themselves this is because of the environment that all of this exists in and sea moss as well it could be accumulating a lot of heavy metals from the environment therefore by you consuming sea moss regularly you could be increasing your exposure to heavy metals such as lead which are very toxic for our body they tend to accumulate in our organs and our fat tissues they are not being detoxified and this is why it is very important to not have an excessive exposure to them over longer periods of time and there was even one study on people in Norway that ate sea moss regularly not in the form of a supplement but just like in with the food I guess they just like sea moss a lot and it was found that some of them actually had a subclinical hypothyroidism so like they almost had brought themselves to developing a condition because of the high iodine content. You do not really know how much iodine or how much heavy metals are in the sea moss supplements. Also, I believe that from batch to batch this would also be different and not all the batches would have the same iodine or the same heavy metal contents. This is because not all sea moss that is harvested is exactly identical. Supplement companies are less regulated than pet food and this is where the huge problem is. It's not that sea moss itself is bad. Just the same way that tuna is not bad, seafood is not bad, they have wonderful benefits for your health, but because of the environment that they exist in and the excessive pollution that of course we as humans have caused, now we have to suffer the consequences and we are not really allowed to consume a lot of those things regularly. Now that I've covered everything, my conclusion would be something that I read in a paper as I was doing research. These very positive scientific findings regarding prebiotics should be translated into guidelines and eating habits, which is something that is not being done. What is being done, of course, because that is what makes money, is that prebiotic blends are being developed by also companies, bigger companies that create things to fortify your product suites, and that is then being put in all of the products to make them, let's say, healthier without actually changing the composition of the diet itself. You're just substituting one soda for the other without making an actual improvement in your basal daily habits. And to reference again the mice study, by improving, let's say, the less important 
problem, which was your daily soda, you're not going to counteract the negative effects of a diet full of highly processed foods that is lacking in fiber and micronutrients. I hope that you now have a better understanding of the topic. Thank you very much for being here with me today. Let me know down in the comments below if you have a topic that you would like me to cover next time. Also, do not forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the contents of today's video. Thank you very much again and I will see you in the next one.